Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back after the uh, Easter weekend. We will now start our media availability with Dr. Fitzgerald and our most recent update. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. As usual, I'll begin with an update uh, on a number of cases in our province. Since uh, the last uh, media release, we have two new positive cases in the province. These cases are within the Western Health region. Public health contact tracing is ongoing, and everyone who is uh, identified as a close contact will be asked to quarantine. Total number of cases in our province is now 244. By region, we have 227 cases in Eastern Health, eight in Central Health, three in Western Health, and six in Labrador Grenfell Health region. 53% of cases are female and 47% are male. By age, there are 20 people under the age of 20, 37 between 20 and 20, uh, 39, 33 between 40 and 49, 53 between 50 and 59, 54 between 60 and 69, and 47 who are 70 and above. Nine people are in hospital due to the virus, and of these patients, three are in intensive care. 133 people have now recovered, and in total, we have tested 4,907 people. We are still in the very early stages of this pandemic, and in keeping the number of new cases to, the min to a minimum will help ensure that our healthcare system has the ability and capacity to readily respond when needed. Last week, we updated the screening criteria for testing to include two or more of the following symptoms that are new or worsening fever or signs of a fever, such as chills, sweat, muscle aches, and lightheadedness, cough, headache, sore throat, and or runny nose. This is, a bro this is broader than the previous symptoms, which were aches and pains, fever, and symptoms of respiratory infections, such as cough or difficulty breathing. Also this past week, we were testing staff and attendees at hospitals, long-term care facilities, personal care homes, home support workers, paramedicine, correction, people who work at correctional facilities and people who attend correctional facilities, emergency shelters, housing programs, transition, ha transition houses, and daycares. Um, these are tested based on symptoms and there are no exposure criteria necessary. Although the few new cases of COVID-19 over the past number of days in our province is encouraging, it is certainly not an indication that we can relax our current efforts. In fact, if we want to obtain the intended outcome of reducing the spread of the virus in our communities, we must remain steadfast in our collective actions and continue to hear, adhere to the public health measures that are in place. I think it would be fair to say that this past holiday weekend tested our resolve against COVID-19. It was reassuring to hear stories of how people adapted their regular Easter traditions by visiting family members online, sharing messages of thankfulness on social media, and dropping meals at doorsteps that would have typically been enjoyed together, all while maintaining safe physical distancing. It was also heartening to see the many rainbows and messages of hope displayed in people's windows in my neighborhood. Quite clearly, this speaks to our resilience and support for one another. While this week would have been Easter break in Newfoundland and Labrador and a time for many families to take vacation or children to participate in sporting events or simply for each of us to enjoy some downtime, we know this has not been our typical spring. COVID-19 has interrupted our lives, our customs and our interactions with others. And while this has brought about feelings of stress and uncertainty for us as adults, it may be even more anxiety provoking for our children who are well accustomed to a daily routine, extracurricular activities and the freedom to spend time with their friends. It is now more important than ever to foster supportive relationships with our children to help alleviate any fear they may have related to COVID-19. Be attentive and speak with them about their concerns. Let them know there are many people working hard every day to keep them safe. And there will come a time again when they will be able to resume their lives doing all of the things that they enjoy. A consistent yet flexible routine, regular exercise, healthy eat, eating habits, and an appropriate amount of sleep each night also help. Encourage your children to stay socially connected through the day with their peers through technology. And while it may be difficult to do for parents working at home, 
Try to take 20 minutes to do something of your kids' choosing. Play a game, take a walk, read to them. These actions will go a long way in helping your child feel safe and secure. There are many mental health supports available for children and adults in our province finding it difficult to cope with COVID-19. Please visit bridgethegapwith2ps.ca to access age-appropriate programs and services that are available locally, confidentially, and free. As a recap, for those who may have just joined us, we have two new cases since yesterday's media release. The total number of cases in the province is now 244. There are 227 cases in Eastern Health, eight in Central Health, three in Western Health, and six in Labrador Grenfell Health. We have seen evidence of how together we can curb the spread of COVID-19 in our province, but we need to keep this momentum going. Please continue to do your part. Stay home as much as possible. Only go out for essentials. Wash your hands often and well, and use proper cough and sneeze etiquette. And please remember to stay home if you're feeling unwell. Our collective actions will have a significant impact on how COVID-19 progresses in this province. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald, and good afternoon, everyone. I trust you had a nice Easter weekend. It was certainly, as Dr. Fitzgerald said, a very different one for all of us. Many of you uh, might have known that we lit up Confederation Building last night. It was lit in bright yellow, and this was to recognize the work of the essential workers in our province as they continue to, to provide a, a critical services for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. This, for us, was a gesture of thanks for the dedication and their resilience during this pandemic. It is our essential workers that are providing safety, stability, and comfort at a time when nothing is ordinary. Please, once again, accept our sincere gratitude. While this is a stressful and challenging period, there will come a day when we will overcome this pandemic. But that's up to you and your actions. That day will come even sooner if we all continue to follow physical distancing and look out for each other. By doing this, it will ensure the safety of essential workers who continue to go above and beyond on a daily basis. Heading into this Easter weekend, all of us at this table stress the importance of staying together by staying apart. So I appreciate your efforts to flatten the curve. Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have weathered many difficult events in our history, and I am confident that we will emerge from this pandemic as strong as ever. But we will only emerge by our actions. Remember, the virus only moves when you move. I know the number of new positive cases, as Dr. Fitzgerald just said, well, they haven't been high over the last few days. But that doesn't mean our numbers won't go up. This is a time of the year when many people, I guess, in a normal year would be looking at report cards and updates and so on. What you have to keep in mind is that your report card for your Easter weekend activities, well, that's still a few days away. Are the results that we have now a sign of people being compliant with the guidelines? Well, yes, I would say they are. But your Easter weekend, that grade will come a little bit later. But we need you to continue your physical distancing and washing your hands at every opportunity. We need you to stay disciplined. That is what will stop the spread of this virus. We have to maintain a distance of six feet apart. So why is this? Because we are not out of the woods yet. We ask you to stay at home as much as possible and only leave the house if you need essentials such as groceries or medication. Now there's been a lot of chatter on social media and throughout conversations that I've had where people are talking about large amounts of snowmobilers across the province and people once again gathering at cabins. I said that these are very different times. What would have been normal last year is not normal this year. Now, for many of you, 
your cabin is a place of solitude. What we have to remember is that it doesn't matter where you are, you have to practice the health guidelines that our chief medical officer has put in place. Now, there is no question. Family gatherings look very different over this Easter weekend. In fact, it's probably the first time that I haven't been with mine. But like so many others, I had a virtual Easter this weekend. Many of you, I've noticed, have shared your experience in the ideas online, which was great. It was inspiring. So I want to thank you for being so open and sharing with all of us. And thank you once again for practicing safe physical distancing that would otherwise be a weekend that would be filled gathering with families and friends. Now, over the past few days, I've noticed a lot of people talking about testing for COVID-19. People have been sharing their concerns. They've been asking questions about the level of testing. You've seen media outlets, provinces, and the United States talking about testing. Well, many people in, across Canada, they refer to the testing amongst provinces as a per 100,000. So I want to assure you that we're in the middle of the pack. If you look at Eastern Health as an example, some 1,175 tests per 100,000. If this was in Lab Grenfell, it would be 807. So if you look at Eastern Health, we would be right in the middle of the pack. And that is where been the focus based on where we've seen the positive results. So right now we have seven people in the, in the hospital in our province, and we don't want that to increase. However, without your continued commitment, it will. Each and every one of you, we all have a part to play. And be extremely careful, especially around long-term care homes and personal care homes, home support workers. In most of these homes, this is where our seniors are. And this is a population that we've counted on for all our lives, and now they are counting on us. Now is when they need us the most. And by saying that, I mean by staying away from them. Now, we have put in strict measures in place for visitation. Difficult for many of our families, but it is extremely important. And I know no different for me than my mother. I know she likes to socialize a bit. She would like to get out and about. But for her sake and the sake of all our seniors, it's important that we follow the guidelines. Now, we've been adjusting through FaceTime, talking on the phone more, some of you waving through windows. The only people in, their, in those homes right now on a regular basis will, should be the staff. And we appreciate the work that they've been doing as they've been keeping themselves safe, which in turn keeps our residents safe. For those staff mem members practicing safe physical distancing outside of their homes, outside of the workplace is extremely important. That will contain the spread of the virus in these homes. And I want to thank you for your commitment. Because the last thing we want is to see a staff member cause the spread of this virus into those homes. So keep up the good work. Now, speaking of work, over the weekend, the federal government passed a COVID-19 wage subsidy bill. This is a multi-billion dollar program called the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. And this is put in place to work with companies to keep them to avoid laying off employees during this global pandemic, encourage those companies to rear workers and offering them a 75% wage subsidy over the next three months. This is for businesses that would have lost 30% of the revenue due to the crisis. Now, you've heard me say over the past few weeks, we have an economic crisis on the other side of this health pa pandemic. This subsidy that I've just mentioned is going to support and aid businesses in our province weather this storm together. Once again, I'd encourage you for the most up-to-date information on supports, both provincially and federally, we ask you to visit the COVID-19 website. That's gov.nl.ca with a forward slash COVID-19. So in addition to supports and resources, you will find information on a self-assessment tool, some myth busters trying to keep facts that are trusted and factual on our website important to advise you. 
As been mentioned, this is an evolving situation, both provincially and federally, so visit that site for the most up-to-date information. Now, as we head into another week, perhaps you can look at using some of the information, as our Chief Medical Officer just said, use this information as a tool to share with your children. I'm sure they have lots of questions about COVID-19, and while they're asked to stay away from the family and their friends, it's good to keep them informed on the level that they understand. And as Dr. Fitzgerald just said, spending 20 minutes a day having those conversations could go a long way in supporting them in what is a very unusual time for them. I know what we've been asking you is a lot to absorb. I know for many of you it's difficult. But in order for us to have any sort of a normal future, we must remain vigilant, we must remain determined, we must remain disciplined. Do not let up. Together, let's take a hold of this virus before it takes a hold of you. Now turn it over to Dr. Hagee for his update. <clears throat> thank you very much, Premier. Um, I too would like to take the opportunity to uh, thank those of you who had a socially responsible, physically distant, uh, but connected Easter. Uh, I had a, an online family gathering of my own and it was uh, noisy and enjoyable. But I think the key, me key message here is that uh, there are a large number of people who have taken the recommendations and instructions from Dr. Fitzgerald to heart, uh, and for that, I, I thank them. I don't take any comfort at all, though, from the small numbers of cases that we've had over this weekend. It is an indicator that two weeks ago and around the time of our state of emergency, uh, we moved and things have improved since then. However, driving home on Thursday night, I was struck at Woods Access Points by large clumps of vehicles. Uh, and I worry that there are people off there in the woods at the weekend doing in the woods things that they wouldn't be doing in their communities in terms of physical distancing and abiding by the orders and rules, hoping to get away with it and look for loopholes. From uh, beach parties in New Melbourne to bars in Colliers with picnic tables and people obviously not physically distancing. I had a Facebook deluge of uh, messages such as that. Uh, I even have today now hotel operators advising me that they're turning down reservations quite responsibly, and I thank them for it, for um, family parties in hotel rooms, again, doing the house party in a hotel. For heaven's sake, what is it that I have to say to get people to understand that looking for loopholes like this may give you a short-term buzz and a feeling of getting away with something, but at the end of the day, you then take back everyone else's viruses to give to your loved ones and your family. It is not at all sensible. It is not at all responsible. It's dangerous, and really, it needs to stop. How well we've done this weekend, we won't know. We'll see a change in figures at the weekend of this week if things have gone the way I worry they may have. And for that reason, this week it is crucial that we slip no further. You've heard Dr. Fitzgerald from day to day talk about management of the pandemic and recommendations and orders of the day, and you've seen these change. These change to follow the Public Health Agency of Canada and federal recommendations best, based on their skills and their evidence and their experts. And we have done our best, Dr. Fitzgerald and the department, to tune these to Newfoundland and Labrador. So they've changed. And it can be hard to keep up. And I sympathize. Uh, but as the Premier has said, our web page and 811 are the place to find facts uh, and policies and orders that are updated literally uh, as they're made. Uh, the definition now for uh, diagnosing potential COVID-19 cases has broadened. Uh, and we have also adopted the approach late last week of testing any symptomatic individual in the category of essential worker, long-term care resident, or people in and around acute care. Those two factors of themselves will increase the number of people tested in this province. Uh, procurement, however, for the equipment, 
the reagents, the PPE, is still something of a challenge. And until those uh, cargoes have been inspected and are divvied up and land here, we actually don't know what we've got until we can count it ourselves. So there's always that air of uncertainty, and that has driven some of our decisions. Uh, but again, our aim has been to protect our frontline workers to the greatest extent uh, and in line with current guidelines. We have a small but consistent number of people hospitalized. And again, that small number has not diminished. It is of concern to us. And to protect our most vulnerable, I have instructed the regional health authorities with immediate effect that nobody who works across sites in long-term care should continue to do so. They should be allocated to a single site and remain working there to the exclusion of others for the duration of this pandemic, at the very least. Um, this morning, I was impressed with the NLMA and the other Dr. Fitzgerald talking about the need to look at issues uh, related to other health issues uh, that may be going on at the moment. Um, we've seen a lot of appointments cancelled and a lot of tests deferred. And I think now as time passes, it's incumbent upon both the primary care providers, doctors and nurse practitioners, the specialists, and also the patients to reassess their own situations in the light of the passage of time. And whether or not something could have waited two weeks in mid-March, the question now is, should they wait any longer? Now it is the middle of April. And that discussion has to take place between uh, physician, nurse practitioner, and patient. And it may need to take place between primary care provider and specialist. But each of us has a responsibility to look at that from their own lens and decide what needs to change. Because again, this is a dynamic situation and it's not a sprint, it's a marathon and we need to, we need to prepare for that. Um, for methadone and suboxone clients who have experienced significant challenges over the last little while, we have now set up a uh, toll-free number uh, where if you have challenges accessing support services or your medications, you can call Monday to Friday during the working day, and that is 1-844-752-3588, and that number will be posted up on our website very shortly. I just want to end by saying thank you to those people who take their social responsibilities uh, seriously. We need to create a bubble of protection around ourselves and our family. We need to stay in it, and we need not to burst anyone else's bubble. That is the sensible thing to do. The long haul, it has shown it has worked in other jurisdictions, and it can work here. So please listen to the recommendations, follow the orders, and we'll see with the passage of time really how good we have been. Uh, and with that, I'll close, Premier, and hand it back to you for questions. Thank you, uh, Minister Hagee. Uh, now we now turn it over to the media for uh, today's questions. For the benefit of our speakers, we have seven reporters registered for today's call. In the essence of time, each reporter will have the opportunity to ask two questions. We suggest that you not ask rumor-based questions. The purpose of these briefings is to address COVID-19 issues. All other government-related issues should be directed to the appropriate department or agency for response. Reporters will ask questions in the order they register for today's call, and we will run through the telephone queue, and I will call on each reporter by name to ask questions. Please do not press star 1 until your name has been called. Following this, should time permit, reporters will be individually asked for single questions. This call will end at 2.59 p.m., and further questions can be emailed. Our first questions today are from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Thank you, Kathy. Um, in terms of speaking to testing, we know that only 181 tests were done from Saturday through to Monday. What made the change to change the testing criteria? I know that was announced last week, but what initiated that change? So <clears throat> when we, as I've said before, we look at um, trends and, and uh, what's happening elsewhere in the country as well as what's happening here. And based on that information um, and the fact that uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada um, had recommended some changes with regard to case definition, uh, we decided to broaden our uh, 
our uh, reach, I guess, for testing. And uh, so that was the main reason. And, uh, and then we just want to make sure that uh, we are seeing all the cases. We want to find as many cases as we can. And we know that uh, by expanding the testing to ensure that we're catching cases that are happening with those, uh, potentially happening in those vulnerable population areas is very important. So um, that was the main uh, reasoning behind that. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and looking to the fishery, I know it's a question we're asking repeatedly here, but plant workers in particular are looking for any directive on if there's an announcement coming, if they can expect more uh, guidelines. They do not feel safe in their work environment, having to work so closely to others. I would say 50% uh, of the emails I've received over the last three or four days have been related to the fishery, either from harvesters or from plant workers. Uh, and when this meeting concludes here, we will be uh, uh, meeting with uh, officials to discuss uh, what makes sense. Uh, we have clear guidelines around how uh, businesses and operations should run uh, with respect to PPE and physical distancing. The question then is whether or not those can realistically ever take place in the confines of a longliner or, or an offshore boat, let alone within a plant. And so those are discussions that literally will be happening uh, again this afternoon. We're conscious of deadlines. We know the federal government who have jurisdiction over the fishery have made some changes to the dates uh, and will be working with uh, fisheries and land resources to see what their view is about whether or not they should be lobbying to change those too. Thank you. Our next questions are from Holly McKenzie Souter of the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Testing criteria kind of being expanded to workers in uh, long-term care homes and kind of what Dr. Fitzgerald listed at the beginning, uh, does that apply to all workers or just people who are symptomatic? Uh, so testing will only be done on symptomatic uh, people um, unless in the course of a contact tracing investigation they feel they need to test people who don't have symptoms and uh, in that situation it may happen but um, generally, testing will happen for symptomatic people only. Could I just put in as well, we've said in the past that a positive test means you stay home, a negative test means you stay home, but we've underlined it all with the fact that particularly for essential workers, but really for any worker, if you are not feeling well, do not go to work. You don't need a sick note, certainly through the RHAs. That was clarified many weeks ago. If you are not well, stay home. Thanks. And the second question on the limiting uh, care home workers to one site, does that apply to like privately run personal care homes as well? Obviously, I can deal in a sense more directly with the regional health authorities and can mandate certain things through the CEOs. We've done that with long term care. The issue of personal care homes, obviously they're private independent businesses and we have a, a significant stewardship and oversight role. So we will be discussing with them uh, how we can line them up best with this policy too. And I would suspect that there will be changes made in that area within the next uh, few uh, hours or days. Our next questions are from Elizabeth Witten of All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. Have there been any updates regarding our PPE supply and the potential lo local manufacturing capabilities? There have been updates. Uh, we know that there have um, been more deliveries uh, into uh, mainland Canada through the federal procurement process. We have had some deliveries over the course of the last few days of N95s. And I think at this point, I'd also like to shout out to some of our local private businesses uh, and uh, companies who've actually donated their own and it would be uh, unfortunate for me to name them because I'm bound to forget one and that would be unfair but I really do uh, uh, gratefully acknowledge the, the work that they have done. Um, we are not in a situation where at any stage we're getting anything like the amounts that we ordered uh, and we can't even rely on the delivery dates. I do know that the federal government have been very keen on putting agents uh, actually as far away as China and Indonesia 
to check shipments before they're loaded to make sure that those destined for Canada and Canadian destinations are actually fit for the purpose because that has been a problem. So PPE will continue to be something that keeps us all awake and indeed we actually have a 24-hour operation. We are working with local industry. I'm not sure that I could give you a, a very detailed update as to where they are but again the challenge there is to making sure what we can produce locally is actually meeting specification and we've got some local mechanisms dealing with that at the moment. Thank you. And after this long weekend, I was wondering how many police investigations are now ongoing? The last update was four, but I'm wondering after this weekend, was there an uptick in, in forms being filled out and, you know, RNC and RCMP officers going out? I can certainly get you that number. I have seen some today, but it would be wrong of me to try and quote from memory. I know both the RNC and the RCMP have had units out the weekend and have responded to calls. So I can get you that information for later on. Thank you. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. In the price of oil today, I got a question for the, for the Premier. Um, you know, can you give us an idea of how big of a hit um, that, that the drop in oil prices has had on uh, provincial coffers since the beginning of, of the situation with COVID-19? And can you give a dollar figure, if possible? Are we able to, to, to say how much of an impact it's had? It will be a little, little difficult to determine what the dollar figure would be at this point. It's in the hundreds of millions of dollars for sure. And, of course, for us, when you look at royalties, this would be about a billion dollars. So when you're taking hundreds of millions of dollars out of it, Largely, too, it's connected to this as currency, so in some cases that has been helpful, but we've seen production levels down. Uh, this was even going into COVID-19, production levels were down, but the price of oil has had a drastic impact. And with the uh, decisions that were made out of OPEC Plus on, on Friday this week, you know, we've seen not really a, a big surge, a big uptake in the increase of oil. There's been some but simply because right now uh, any of the decisions that are made globally by OPEC Plus will have you know probably months before we see that trickle through because the inventories around the world are have increased. Or, you know most most areas now with tanks are at capacity. Added to that, the difficulty uh, facing that industry is just demand. People are trapping less, so the demand on oil and gasoline, diesel. And fuels, of course, is, is decreased dramatically as well. So in our province, it's a, a drastic uh, decrease in revenues for us and will have a major impact on the revenue streams provided to our province. Added to that, as a result of the low oil prices, we're seeing exploration and some changes that have been made offshore just in operations alone. So in every way you look at it, it's impacted the revenue of this province. Um. And if, if this pandemic situation continues uh, into the fall as, as the models, and I, I recognize these are models, but as, as they say, it could happen, you know, how long, we've already had to, to, to borrow about $2 billion since the beginning of this situation. How long until the province would need to, uh, to, to be in a situation where it would have to borrow again? Well, it will largely determine, you know, what the federal response to this. I was speaking to Seamus Reagan, the Minister of Natural Resources, again this morning, as well as working with our, our provincial minister here, Minister Cody, who is, you know, doing some work as well on this file, as well as the Minister of Finance. So it will determine in large part what the federal response will be to the energy sector, to the oil sector we're seeing working with Alberta and Saskatchewan and Newfoundland and Labrador, realizing these provinces are three the three within the Confederation that will be impacted the most by the price of oil. But indeed, about 25% of the GDP of the, pro of the country is connected to, uh, connected to oil and gas in the energy sector. So it's a, a provincial problem, it's a national problem, and we'll be working closely with the federal, uh, problem, with the federal government you know, to, for support for that, uh, for that sector. Our next questions are from Ben Murphy of VOCM News. Please go ahead. Murphy, please press star one. Uh, as you mentioned in your preamble, lots of talk of get-togethers over the weekend, whether that be at cabins, Easter dinners, to-do trips. Do you expect to see the numbers increase in the next 10 to 14 days? I don't know. It depends on what people did in the woods where they thought no one was looking. And um, in saying that, we are seeing the recovery numbers surpass the number of new cases now for the last number of days. 
Is this a good sign at all, or is it still just far too early to tell? It's very good for those people who've recovered. Uh, it's uh, uncertain as to what this means long term. Uh, the facts of the case are we are nowhere near out of the woods yet. We have to be graded, as the Premier said, on our behaviour for the Easter report card, and those grades won't come in until next week. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. In Bay Despair, there are concerns about access to local doctors. In fact, uh, there isn't access to local doctors at a time when a lot of people are worried about that because of COVID-19. What's being done there in order to make sure uh, that there is either a locum or some sort of coverage to be able to have a local clinic there? Thank you very much. It's a very good question. It's certainly been a topic for the people of Milltown, Bay to Spare, and Head of the Bay, and St. Albans. And I've been uh, having regular discussions with uh, Mr. Loveless, the uh, MHA for the area, as well as uh, staff in the department. So it's a, it's a hot topic. Uh, the facts of the case are there was one doctor practicing solo down there, uh, and uh, that's no longer possible for that individual to continue. Uh, that were, discovery was made on Thursday of last week, immediately prior to a holiday weekend. Um, several things are in train. Uh, one, they are um, able through central health to provide access to some physician cover. There are nurse practitioners available in the area who can also step in. In terms of emergency services, uh, we are working with the Department and Central Health over access to physicians virtually uh, for um, the clinic in St Albans uh, out of hours. Uh, and then we're also discussing in the light of a, a virtual mechanism like that, where it would be best and safest for the individuals who were seen that way to go. Historically, there has been a link with Conagra, uh, but also there has been significant concern from the residents about maybe traveling an hour or two in the wrong direction, as it were, uh, only to have to go back to Central Newfoundland Regional Health Center. Uh, so uh, that is a, a matter of active discussion uh, between my staff in the department now uh, and Central Health to try and work that out. Obviously, we can't knit physicians at short notice. We do have some more tools in our toolbox now than we ever had, particularly with regard to virtual care. And we're seeing what we can craft there to, uh, to make the residents and inhabitants of that area feel more comfortable. The number of new cases we've seen continues to decline. Uh, even looking at last week's models that were showing cases should continue to rise. You've been talking a lot about a surge. Where is the surge going to come from? That's a very good question, and we've been relying on uh, modeling or projections from Dr. Rahman and his team. Facts of the case are, and we've talked about it in other contexts, um, the virus is here. Uh, it's out there. And this is why our mantra has been around physical distancing. It's happened in other jurisdictions. It's no reason to believe it's any different here, particularly with our extensive travel connections across uh, mainland Canada and into the West. But the facts of the case are um, uh, we need to rely on social distancing. The only way the virus reproduces is if it spreads, and the only way it spreads is if we move. So regardless of what the numbers show in the immediate short and medium term we cannot relax physical distancing the only question in my mind is whether we need to be even more strict and more restrictive than we already are bearing in mind the measures that we have in this province at the moment are more restrictive than those that were seen in wartime europe uh, in the second world war our next questions are from David Marr of The Telegram. Please go ahead. Um, Spartan uh, Bioscience, uh, uh, an Ottawa company, has been given uh, Health Canada approval for a new half-hour test kit um, to be distributed uh, effective immediately. I'm wondering, does the province have any uh, agreement in place with this company, or are you seeking an agreement? The Health Canada approval means it's safe to use and reliable for the, maybe for the purposes for which it was designed. It doesn't say that it is an extra usable tool in our toolbox. That uh, assessment tool, that uh, kit, has to be validated and has to go through uh, procedures that would show where it would fit uh, in 
our uh, management of a pandemic. So uh, last uh, Thursday, we had a, um, uh, a health minister's conference call and technologies like this were a, a subject of discussion because obviously people are really interested uh, in, in its usability. That has not yet been defined. One of the challenges with these tests is that they can be quite good at detecting who's got it, but they may be way less reliable at detecting those people who reliably haven't got it. And that's as big a problem in some respects. So their, their role yet is not proven. When that work is complete and we have uh, access to that through BC or Alberta or wherever uh, in the federal government, when that work is complete and we know what its use is going to be, then we can decide uh, what best to do with it and how best to employ it. There are several of these coming forward at the moment, and this is just the first Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also, uh, um, I'm aware of at least, uh, I'm personally aware of at least one person uh, who was part of the, the, the Calls Funeral Home cluster um, who returned a positive result uh, for COVID-19 as late as, as April 9th. Um, I'm wondering how many such cases uh, uh, is, uh, you know, are, are the health professionals um, aware of? And, and is, there, is there anything different being done to handle people who are showing positive results for, uh, for a longer period of time? We do know that people turn positive quite late in the incubation periods. Most people who develop symptoms do so early on, but not all. Uh, that's why it's 14 days and not 12 or 10. Uh, and we do know there have been people who have uh, developed symptoms late on. Uh, and so that's why once you have been involved in the contact tracing, even if you don't have symptoms, you are required to stay home for 14 days from your exposure and if you develop symptoms, then public health will get back to you or you will get back to them. There's a dialogue and then you'll be retested if appropriate. Uh, and we do know that that has happened. One of the challenges with any of the tests for COVID-19 is that they are way better at telling you you've got it than reliably telling you you haven't. So uh, that's part of the system we have in place at the moment. It's factored in. If the information changes about whether or not 14 days is the right time, and it hasn't yet, then certainly that would be something we'd take into consideration very quickly. So, David, I think, too, just to build on what uh, Minister Hagee has said related to this, is let's not forget that what might seem like a long time ago, it's essentially not a month ago since this cluster at the funeral home was uh, ha happened. So when you think about it, less than a month, less than 30 days, in the life of the virus within this community, you could tell the significant impact why and therefore why we must remain diligent and disciplined throughout all of this. So it's not unusual to see you know, new cases like the one you've just mentioned, but it once again exaggerates and reminds us of why, uh, why we must remain social distancing or physical distancing has been mentioned. And the minister and the chief medical officer talked about this uh, extensively for, uh, for, this, for this whole month. We now have about 15 minutes left for questions, so we'll start a single question round, starting with Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Ms. Roberts, please press star one. Ms. Roberts? Please press star one if you have a question. She has not queued up for her question. Let's move on to Holly McKenzie Souter of the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, just more on this policy of kind of one facility for the long-term care workers. I mean, what's the plan there for dealing with severe staffing shortages in some areas or concerns that might, some places might not be able to, you know, function as they normally would. Obviously, that's an issue that the regional health authorities have been aware of. My understanding is that uh, that is uh, not as much of a challenge uh, in certain areas. I think it's much more of an issue for the metro area uh, where facilities are close together. I think as you move into rural areas, where there is much more um, distance and commuting time, 
that this may be uh, less of a phenomenon. Uh, my understanding around long-term care facilities, for example, in Central, is the issue is more physician mobility between long-term care facilities than nursing care or other health care workers, for example. So each RHA will have a different take on it, uh, but they, they've known it was coming uh, and they have uh, been planning for it. Operator, could we check back to see if Kelly Ann Roberts has questions? Certainly. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure what happened there. Sorry. Um, we know that at the airport, people are still arriving. Um, we're hearing reports, though, that people are still able to walk by, um, not being given a pamphlet, not being told to give any contact information. Um, is there any other measures we're taking to make sure those arriving in the province are notified of the measures? My understanding is those issues around uh, people skirting the, uh, the table, for example, in the arrivals area at St. John's uh, predate uh, our last change. Uh, the last I heard of was that was, uh, was a correspondence, but it was dated uh, nearly two weeks ago. Uh, I have, through staff, spoken to Eastern Health, who have uh, been staffing uh, St. John's arrival area, uh, and through random checks, uh, and my understanding is that that is no longer happening. Thank you. Our next question is from Elizabeth Witten of All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. So, wondering how many cases are now linked to the calls cluster? Um, 177. Thank you. Our next question is from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Uh, the total number of ICU admissions to date. Um, you guys are given a total for you know a specific day every day. Um, but can you give? Do you have a, a tally of how many people have been admitted to intensive care because of uh, COVID nineteen? The total uh, that I have currently is seven as of today. Um, certainly, we refresh this data usually around seven thirty every morning, uh, so that reflects the day's totals. Uh, in terms of cumulative, I can certainly check back if there's a difference, but my understanding is uh, that that's accurate on a daily basis. Our next question is from Ben Murphy of VOCM News. Please go ahead. Dr. Fitzgerald, can you tell us whether or not the two new cases in Western Health Region are linked to travel or if they're community spread? Both are travel-related. Our next question is from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. Dr. Hagee, you have mentioned some concern about people, for example, gathering at the cabin. Technically, though, if it's a group of fewer than five people, they're not breaking the rules. Do you, you mentioned the possibility of tightening rules. Do you plan on looking at actually making that something that the RNC would be able to enforce and ticket? I think you're addressing a couple of really interesting things there. I mean, one of my challenges and one of Dr. Fitzgerald's challenges is we're regulating increasingly narrowing areas of people's existence. And I know of folk, for example, who would not dream of having anybody from outside of their house or their immediate family group they live with uh, come visit. Um, but I also know of folk who say, well, I'm going to have four buddies around tonight and we're going to play PlayStation and have a few beers. And then each of those four will go off and do exactly the same with a different group of four. The facts of the case are this virus will not move if you don't. D it, the common sense needs to be applied to this. Uh, and just because it isn't specifically forbidden for you to do something doesn't mean to say you should go out and do it. I mean, this is kind of a rather immature, childish uh, way of approaching uh, recommendations and rules. We're not doing this for the fun of it. We're trying to keep people alive here and well. Why do you feel the need to go and pick a hole in a recommendation and say, this is a way I can get around it, so to hell with you, I'm going to do it. Our next question is from David Marr of The Telegram. Please go ahead. 
I'm, I'm Dr. Fitzgerald. I'm wondering how many of the 244 cases that have been reported um, are the result of community spread? Uh, so the number is still under investigation. Uh, community spread really, when we do a contact uh, investigation, uh, we have to look for a source. And so often community spread comes at the end of that road and uh, it's a diagnosis of excluding every every other possible source. So uh, some of those are still under investigation. I think at this point we've had less than 10 cases. Um, I think it's around uh, six or seven at the moment. Thank you. We'll do a final round of questions, and if time runs out at 2.59, if I've missed somebody, then you can email me your questions. Our next question is from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Breakdown of the 133 rough covered cases per region. I have that, uh, Kellyanne. Uh, we have 127 in Eastern, one in Central, and one in Western, and four in Labrador Grenfell. Thank you. The next question is from Holly McKenzie Souter of the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Please press star one. The, the uh, cases we know of now, are there any more confirmed in uh, care facilities? Um, I missed the beginning of that, Holly, but we only have the one in St. Lawrence that's been confirmed in a long-term care facility that I'm aware of as of coming in this room this afternoon. Our next question is from Elizabeth Witten of All Newfoundland, Labrador. Please go ahead. Uh, is there any update at the, uh, the situation at the U.S. Memorial Health Center in St. Lawrence? Only that we have not identified anyone else as positive. My understanding is that all the uh, residents have been tested and are negative, uh, and I'm not aware of any of the staff through contact tracing that have tested positive either. Um, w there was late last week one individual visitor who we was still trying to track down, but I'd have to go back to public health to see if that had occurred. Thank you. Our next question is from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Speaking as the, as the weather gets uh, nicer, uh, walking around and stuff, um, par but Park City Park, National Historic Sites are, are still closed. Um, you know, as the weather gets better, are these still places, public places still going to be shut? What are people, uh, you know, as people, more people go out, uh, are we going to change expectations? So I think certainly we'll have to uh, consider what our epidemiology is uh, in the province at the time when, when the weather gets nicer and, and when I, I'm not going to be fooled by the last three days. So I'm not convinced we still got a lot of April to get through yet. But, um, uh, you know, we'll have to look at what our situation is and make decisions uh, based on, on what the epidemiology tells us at that time. Our next question is from Ben Murphy of VOCM News. Please go ahead. Premier, people are asking about being able to buy alcohol from restaurants when making takeout orders, and I believe some 8 to 10 provinces are on board doing this to be a huge help for restaurants who are struggling right now. Why are we not doing this here? Well, it's something that, you know, we've looked at and something I think that there is, you know, agreement to do in our province as well, similar to what you've seen in other provinces. So I think we're supportive of this. It's really now getting to the point where as we look at this, it requires a legislative change. And we've only had that one session in the House of Assembly with some 10 members there. And that, uh, that session was primarily based on, um, you know, the financial uh, situation within our province, getting us in the situation where we could borrow some money that we needed and a few other things that we had to do. It's a very limited session that we've had. It's not to say that, you know, at some point if we get back in there that this and, and any number of other issues that we're still facing that would require some legislative changes that we would not do that then. But the priority of the first session was get us in a situation where we could actually borrow, you know, to keep the uh, services being paid for within our province. We were able to do that successfully with the uh, support of our uh, all, all parties and independents within the House that day. Thank you. Our next question is from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. 
to cutting production for oil, the federal government has said it's going to be up to the provinces to make decisions about whether they should cut that in order to help boost prices. Uh, do we plan on asking producers or requiring producers to cut their production? Yeah, that's not a decision, you know, that we've been uh, we've been asked uh, or would want to do right now. It's a very limited amount of production that we would see within Newfoundland and Labrador. I know Alberta, and speaking with, uh, you know, Premier Kenny and, and others, is, they've had those kinds of discussions right now, uh, just in a less than 300,000 barrels per day being produced in Newfoundland and Labrador. It's, uh, you know, for us, it would have a major impact on our province, but yet not a big impact on the national pr uh, production. You know, so right now with the discussions that we've had last week uh, with the uh, with our provincial minister and with our federal minister, that's not something that we've been asked to do. And but right now, it's important for us that we make sure that we continue to make the uh, make the argument and with the federal government the important role that this energy sector, the oil and gas sector, plays within Newfoundland and Labrador, and that there will be supports that will be required to come out of this as we get through the health crisis and then deal with the economic uh, situation within our province. Our final question is from David Marr of The Telegram. Please go ahead. If you can tell me, uh, or to at least ballpark, um, how many test kits are currently in the province and how many are uh, presumably en route to the province? We don't actually have kits as such, David. What we do is we have components, so we'll have swabs and we have reagents. We have... Um, a significant number of um, tests available in terms of numbers through the new machine we have. We have about reagents for about 15,000 tests on the new machine. I can't tell you exactly what we got on the old machine, but I think it's, uh, it's probably half that number. We have maybe 12 to 13,000 swabs. The, the question then around uh, how you allocate PPE uh, between public health versus acute care, who's got to do the swabs in terms of uh, the bigger number. Uh, that's always a daily, uh, a daily ration. So um, in terms of expecting uh, material, uh, we, are, we have all of those on order. Uh, reagents for the old machine, reagents for the new machine, swabs, and, of course, PPE. And as I said earlier on, we had very kind donation from uh, some of the local uh, businesses and uh, companies in, in Newfoundland and Labrador that's helped alleviate uh, some of our immediate concerns. Uh, for our current burn rate in acute care, we've got anywhere from one to ten weeks' worth of supply. Thank you again. Thank you very much for all of those who've joined us today. The time for questions has ended. Please come back tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m., 1.30 in Labrador for our next news conference. Have a great day.